Hey folks, I'm running a big old review here for the Odyssey Summative. It's the last literary terminology summative that we've got this year. Um, the final um, big assessment, if you want to put it that way, after reading the Odyssey for the past six weeks. So uh, some of this is going to be a review. We've uh, been over literary terms a number of times, but it doesn't hurt to hear them again, especially with some examples in relation to the Odyssey. Uh, so we're going to start with that. We'll do literary terms to start out. Um, then we'll look at terms related to um, heroic epic and those sorts of things. Uh, then we'll do um, the hero's journey and we'll go through that. And then we'll look really quickly at um, the Odyssey and go through sort of a map of the Odyssey. And finally, we'll, we'll take a quick look at uh, themes. And uh, it's not much of a document here, but there are things that we've talked about throughout the entire story. And I'll attach all of these uh, various documents uh, to the review so that you can have them and look at them and you know review them at your leisure. Uh, but let's start out. We uh, from one of the first things we've been talking about um, since the beginning of class is narrator and narrative perspective and the point of view. Um, there's a, a number of different binaries: uh, limited narrator versus omniscient narrator. A limited narrator only knows what the character knows, and omniscient narrator knows everything. One of the fun things about the Odyssey is it's got both. Uh, the majority of the story is narrated by the omniscient narrator. Uh, the voice of the storyteller, which is traditional in heroic epics and things like that. But a significant portion of the story is narrated by Odysseus when he is telling the tale of his adventures to King Alcinous of Phaeacia. Uh, and so you have an omniscient narrator, but you also have a limited narrator. Um, the narrator is uh, also broken down into first person, second person, and third person. A first person narrator uses I. A second person narrator uses you. Um, and a third person narrator, the pronouns are he or she. The omniscient narrator is in the third person, but the limited narrator, Odysseus, is in the first person. He's referring to himself as I throughout. And so it's interesting that we have a limited first person narrator in the story, but we also have an omniscient third person narrator in the story. It's a little, it's a little complicated in that way. Um, the entire story is in the past tense. A past tense narrator uses verbs that end with ed and things have already happened. Whereas a present tense narrator, um, things are happening. If you read The Hunger Games, that was in the present tense, but the Odyssey is definitely a past tense narrator. Um, and then we have this distinction between a reliable and an unreliable narrator. Uh, a, re a narrator that's reliable, you can trust them to tell you the truth. They're not trying to trick you. Uh, there's lots of different ways that narrators can be unreliable, and we've looked at a few of them over the course of the story. We had the crazy narrator of the Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. You couldn't trust him, not because he wasn't being honest. He thought he was telling you the truth. He was just nuts. Uh, and then you had the unreliable animal narrator in Animal Farm. That narrator wasn't trying to trick you either. It was just that that narrator was tricked. And uh, it was stupid and didn't understand what the pigs were doing, but you as a reader were able to see it. Uh, so there's a number of ways that a, a narrator can be unreliable. Um, and I think that you'd have to say that Odysseus himself, when he's narrating, is not only a um, limited first-person narrator, but he's also an unreliable narrator. Sure, he's telling the story, but he's telling the story from his perspective. And especially when he's talking about some of the lessons of hospitality and the, the things that he chooses to say, uh, he's trying to impress on King Alcinous of Phaeacia the importance of treating guests well because he's a guest in his court. And so I think there's a certain element. He's not wholly unreliable, but I, I think there's a certain element of unreliability to Odysseus's narrative. Um, then we can look at the plot structure. Um, you know that the story starts with, the, it's got a setting, time and place in which it occurs. Um, generally speaking, we're dealing with the Mediterranean in ancient Greece, right? Um, the exposition is the information dump at the beginning of the story. We really didn't read the beginning of the Odyssey, so don't stress out about that too much. But most stories begin with a lot of introductions of characters and themes and um, the setting and all of that kind of stuff, which is really important to understanding the story and what's going on. Um, we've got an initiating event, the moment that starts the rising action and introduces the conflict. Obviously, the Odyssey has that, but there's sort of two. One of the interesting things about the Odyssey is it's got two storylines, right? There's a, there's a main storyline, which is the story of Odysseus trying to get home, but there's a secondary storyline, which is about Telemachus trying to find his dad. And so we actually start out with the initiating event for Telemachus's story, uh, where he is told by Athena that he should go try and find his father. And that sort of initiates his story. Um, but Odysseus is sitting on the island of Calypso, and his initiating event is when Hermes comes and tells him that he can go um, home. 
right? And he makes that raft and leaves the island. So um, there's definitely an initiating event there for both of them. Uh, rising action is everything between the initiating event and the climax. I think the climax of both of their stories has to be the suitor battle when you look at the story itself. Um, for a lot of reasons, a lot of the themes uh, come to conclusion there. Um, falling action is tying up a loose ends after the climax. So um, for Odysseus, that's obviously, you know, meeting his wife and having the reunion with her and then seeing his dad and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then how do we deal with the, the blood feud question? Um, all of that stuff comes across at the end of the story. And then the resolution is usually thematic and reinforces the lesson of the story. I don't know that the Odyssey has a very clear resolution. It certainly doesn't end with some final prominent message. It just sort of ends. Um, so take it for what you will. Uh, we've looked at a lot of figurative language. One of the most important things in the Odyssey, in fact, is the way that Homer uses what we call Homeric similes. Sometimes they're metaphors, but most of the time they use like or as. Um, I don't know why as is capitalized and like is not. That bothers me. Um, there, fixed. Uh, so a simile is a comparison using like or as. Homer does these, these famous Homeric similes where he compares actions or events in the story to sort of common everyday experiences that your average Greek would be familiar with. They lose something in translation because we're not an agricultural society living in the fields and we don't see, you know, mountain lions after a kill or hawks diving at formations of birds very often. But a lot of them really do translate pretty well to the modern day. Uh, and you should be able to identify a Homeric simile if I ask you to do so. Um, a metaphor, you know, a similar, he does a lot of metaphorical things too in the same way. He just doesn't use like or as really. You just have to determine whether there's a like or as there. Um, Personification is giving human traits to inanimate things. A lot of times uh, natural events are personified as monsters or as gods. Uh, rosy fingered Dawn would be a great example of a personification. I mean, Dawn literally doesn't have fingers, but we're giving it these human traits uh, and associating it with a goddess. So there's lots of personification. I think that gods or natural phenomenon being personified as, as human like gods is definitely there. Uh, but you also have like um, Charybdis, which is a whirlpool uh, that is, is personified to have human thoughts and you know, desires. So there's stuff like that that happens in the Odyssey as well. Uh, hyperbole is a fancy word for exaggeration. I'm not saying Odysseus is prone to exaggeration, but I think he is. Um, and and so are the suitors. So uh, you can you should be able to find exaggeration anywhere. But remember, if you're writing um, a literary writing of any kind, use your terms. Instead of using the word exaggeration, use hyperbole. Um, Oxymoron is two contradictory words placed together, cold fire, bittersweet. I don't know that I know any of these off the top of my head, um, but you just need to know the term. A paradox is an impossible or logical statement that holds some figurative truth. Again, there's probably some paradoxes in the Odyssey. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I don't know that I'm going to assess you on that. Apostrophe is talking directly to something that cannot respond. I'm sure Odysseus does this a few times throughout the story, talking to an animal or, you know, oftentimes it's even talking to the gods, although the gods do respond through omens and things like this. But um, in, in ancient Greek writing, a lot of times, you know, you'll invoke a god or a goddess and they're not going to respond to you. They're not. Sometimes Athena does actually talk to Odysseus, but that's the exception rather than the rule. Uh, characters, yes. So let's take a look at protagonist and antagonist. I mean, ultimately, the protagonist of the Odyssey is obviously Odysseus. He's your main character. Uh, the protagonist is simply the main character of the story. It's a moral neutral term. It's not good or bad. It's just who the main character is. But you could argue that uh, Telemachus is also a protagonist of the story, especially in the beginning bits where he is by himself on the journey. So if these are the protagonists of the story, who are the antagonists? Well, for Odysseus, the antagonist is different depending on the episode you're dealing with. I mean, if you're looking for the overarching antagonist, maybe it's Poseidon. You know, and maybe that ties into a theme of civilization versus nature. Maybe there's something uh, really clear going on there. But I think you could also say that the antagonist for... Um, Odysseus in the Cyclops episode is clearly the Cyclops, or maybe it's it's Scylla, or maybe it's Circe, or maybe it's Calypso. I mean, he goes through a series of adventures, and it's kind of like each adventure has its own antagonist for him. Um, but really, I would say the overarching antagonist of the story for both um, protagonists, both uh, 
uh, Odysseus and Telemachus are the suitors, uh, particularly Antinous and Eurylochus. These are the, the named suitors who are developed as characters and who are used in juxtaposition to the values of Odysseus and Telemachus throughout the story. So I think you could really look at those characters and say they're the ones who are the main antagonists of the story. Although um, there are certainly others that you could use. Uh, who's in opposition to Odysseus and when? You know, really that's that's sort of the question. Remember that it's the character opposed to the main character. Um, then we uh, can look at direct and indirect characterization. Remember, direct characterization is what the author tells a reader about a character. So if, um, and Homer doesn't do a ton of direct characterization, although occasionally he does. Um, if Homer writes like these suitors are greedy and terrible, that's direct characterization. But if he shows them being greedy and terrible, that's what we call indirect characterization. It's what the author implies about a character through the character's appearance, actions, or dialogue. Uh, so you might want to make a distinction in your mind between what the author literally tells you or what another character literally, literally tells you so you don't have to think and the kinds of things that you have to intuit and, and figure out for yourself. Um, we've got flat and round characters. A flat character is a two-dimensional character without developed history, backstory, motivation. Um, and a round character is a three-dimensional character with a clear history, backstory, and motivation. There's not a ton of round characters in here. Obviously, Odysseus is one. I would say that uh, Telemachus is one, Penelope is one, uh, Eumaeus is one. Uh, you could probably argue that Antinous and Eurylochus are developed enough that you can sort of get them as a round character. Antinous more than Eurylochus because you get a little bit of a story about who his father was and, and his relationship to uh, Odysseus. And then you see his father as a character later. But the vast majority of characters are what we call flat characters. Uh, we don't know their backstory. We don't know their history. We don't know why they're doing what they're doing. There's just not much there. You might argue that um, Odysseus's uh, crewmate, um, oh, I'm struggling to come up with his name, uh, the, the primary crewmate that he has on the ship that, um, you know, uh, is always contradicting his orders um, could be an example of a round character as well. Uh, static and dynamic character. A static character is a character who does not change in perspective, personality, and morality. And a dynamic character is a character who does change in perspective, personality, and morality over the course of the story. I think, again, you could argue that there are really only two dynamic characters in the story. The primary is Odysseus and the secondary is Telemachus. These two characters change in various ways. You can look at Odysseus and his arrogance in the Cyclops episode and, and the way he behaves at the beginning of the story uh, to the way he has to swallow his pride and control his emotions and, and learn all of those things over the course of the story. So he goes through a dynamic change where he learns to be more humble. He learns to be more in control of himself. Um, and all of those sorts of things. Whereas Telemachus, his story is a, a traditional coming of age story. When he starts out, he's a callow youth without any experience, uh, sort of nervous about uh, speaking up in company and taking charge. And he grows into himself as a, as a more confident um, adult uh, following in his father's footsteps over the course of the story. So you can look at that and see his change as well. So there are definitely some dynamic characters in here, but you don't see a lot of other characters who change in any meaningful way. Um, and a stock character is a stereotypical character type. Uh, it's difficult for us to identify stock characters in ancient Greek writing because we're not ancient Greeks. The things that they would see as commonplace are a little more difficult for us to identify. Um, so then we can look at some other literary terms. Foreshadowing, there's lots of heavy foreshadowing in this story. Um, Homer is frequently telling us things, you know, like so-and-so was going to regret those words later when this happens. Or, you know, like the Cyclops' prayer to uh, Poseidon was a direct foreshadow of all the events that happened to Odysseus. In fact, the muses, when, when the story is invocated, has the invocation at the very beginning, they're invocation, you know, summarizes the whole story and tells us what's going to happen. Um, but lots of time people do evil things like Melanthius, the goat herd will do an evil thing. And then the narrator will cut in and be like, he's going to regret that. Right. And so uh, we get, or Antinous's dad, Eurylochus makes, not Eurylochus, um, Eupithius, 
Yeah, I remember some of these names. Uh, Eupithius makes a speech to the people at Ithaca asking to chase Odysseus and get him back. And the narrator's like, he would bite the dust before the end of this day. You know, like, so we get very clear foreshadowing uh, throughout the story from the narrator. Uh, it's when the author hints at things that will happen later. Sometimes just straight up tells us what's going to happen later. Uh, symbolism is when something stands for something else. Again, you've got all the gods standing for... Um, natural phenomenon that would be good examples of symbolism but there's also omens that happen uh, that dream that penelope had in which there were a bunch of geese that were eating her food and then uh, a hawk came down and or an eagle came down and started eating them obviously the geese are symbolic of the suitors and the eagle symbolic of odysseus and so you can actually go through and you can find a lot of very clear symbols some smaller and some sort of bigger and more overarching uh, throughout the entire story itself uh illusions we spent oh theme uh we'll deal with themes actually why don't we deal with themes now seems like a good place to to talk about themes so we're going to jump over to the themes worksheet we talked about a number of themes in the odyssey and obviously there's more than are on this particular list but um let's just go through these these themes really quickly um a theme specifically in odysseus's story when he's narrating his own journey is civilization versus nature uh in some way i think you could say that odysseus being a king of ithaca um very hyper intelligent able to solve any number of difficult problems represents civilization and he's pitted against a lot of creatures that represent nature but the overarching personification of nature is poseidon himself who represents a sea and so it's a struggle between Odysseus, who represents civilization, and Poseidon, who represents the sea. But you could look at the Cyclops. It goes out of its way to tell you how he doesn't follow any rules of civilization, how he doesn't follow the rules of hospitality. He sort of represents nature in that way. You can't bargain with nature. You can't um, pay it off or anything like that. Uh, but you could also look at Scylla and Charybdis as representations of nature. You could look at the Sirens as representations of nature. You could even look at the... Ver um, the way Circe turns um, his men into pigs and is connected with with natural elements as a representation of nature. And even, even the, the journey to the land of the dead is connected here because what's the ultimate natural enemy of all human beings who have ever lived? It's death, right? Like we, we are temporal. We live in time and you can't get out of that. Um, I think the famous saying is time is the fire in which we all burn. And that's a metaphor, uh, but it's it's a strong metaphor. We can't escape. There's an inevitability of death. And on some level, I think all all books that were ever written are about uh, the inescapable nature of our own mortality and a, an attempt to rationalize and sometimes even escape that. The earliest written work is a, a famous um, Babylonian, uh, I don't know if it's Babylonian or Sumerian, but whatever, uh, epic called Gilgamesh and Gilgamesh is a hero who's on, on a journey and the goal of his journey is to gain immortality right and so uh the ultimate personification of nature is the inevitability of death I would argue anyway I'm on a, I'm on a tangent uh the importance of family really strong theme throughout both in Odysseus's narrative and uh in the storyteller's voice narrative uh, Odysseus is trying to get home he's been trying to get home for for 10 years he spent 10 years at Troy and then he spent another 10 years trying to get home and uh, everybody's trying to stop him. The Lotus Eaters, um, you know, would, would trick him into living there forever and forgetting about his family. Or, um, you know, all of these obstacles are in his way. And at the end of the day, what he wants to do is get back to his family. And so this is a story about family values. Um, you've got characters who represent sort of the opposite of family values. And uh, they are brought low and get the poetic justice that they deserve. And Odysseus, who just wants to reunite with his family, ends up doing that. So uh, the central importance of family, I think, is a, is a key theme here. And you see it, especially even in the, in the sort of like resolving chapters of the epic. Uh, he goes and sees his dad, and we have this scene where the three generations of male uh, Odysseuses, I don't know, Odysseus, Laertes, and Telemachus are fighting together uh, in sort of this unified front against uh the fathers of the suitors who had come to get them and so there is a family theme going through and even the even the suitors dads who go to try and avenge them there's a theme of family running through that too and it makes them a little sympathetic uh the importance of hospitality 
that's a theme that is central throughout the story. And we've talked about this. Odysseus really plays it up when he's with King Alcinous to try and, and make Alcinous hospitable to him. Uh, but that's also probably strongly put into the story because the, the story would have been told by a traveling storyteller who was relying on the hospitality of various um, kings or lords uh, when he would go to their houses and tell stories. And so the hospitality, I think, is very stressed throughout the entire story. And you've got sort of two angles on it that I think are important. Number one is sort of the Cyclops story um, and, and the angle that that one shows, which is the importance of being a good host of treating your guests well and giving them everything they need. But you also have the other one, which is the suitors, which is the importance of being a good guest and treating your host well. And so we get sort of both angles of the importance of hospitality from the angle of a host and from the angle of a guest. And we see them and we're given examples of what somebody who is a good host looks like, uh, Alcinous, and what a bad host looks like you know, the, the Cyclops. We were given an example of what a good guest looks like, Odysseus, and what a bad guest looks like, the suitors. And so you're able to come to a moral conclusion a after reading this as an ancient Greek reader about how to behave in those situations. Uh, respect the gods. That's an important theme. Obviously, it, it initially comes up when Odysseus uh, has this arrogance. These two are really tied together. Um, so I'll just do them both at once. Has this arrogance in relation to the Cyclops. And he's like, hey, my name's Odysseus. Tell your dad. Right? Like he gets in all this trouble because he's arrogant and he disrespects Poseidon um, by blinding his son and then bragging about it. And so he gets punished for that. He gets what's coming to him. Um, and it's, it, maybe it's unfortunate, but that's how it turns out. But then we have the suitors who are disrespecting Zeus uh, and... Actually, the Cyclops gets blinded because he disrespects Zeus, too. So you see in a lot of areas of the story um, how this turns out, how how anything, anytime you disrespect the god, something's going to go wrong for you. Uh, and then finally, coming of age, that's a Telemachus theme, um, this idea about growing into your own man and um, taking on the responsibilities of adulthood and what it means to be an adult in Greek society and the kinds of behaviors that you should have. And again, in order to understand this one, I think you need to contrast Telemachus with um, Antinous and Eurydocus. And he, these two are, are people who are coming into an adulthood physically, but not mentally and emotionally. And they're contrasted with Telemachus, who is physically coming into adulthood, but also mentally and emotionally coming into adulthood. And so you want to see that um, and, and judge that. So those are the themes that we talked about. And you should be able to identify a, a location in the story where the theme is prominent and be able to uh, maybe pull a quote and back it up. Uh, all right, back to our story or our terms list itself. Uh, we were just on theme. Uh, illusion. A reference to an earlier and well-known story, event, person, place, uh, or myth. We have looked at, I don't know how many illusions in, over the course of this story. Uh, most of them are to earlier myths. Tiresias was an allusion to the Oedipus myth. And uh, Achilles and Agamemnon, they're an allusion to the Trojan War myth. Persephone is obviously a goddess, but she's also an allusion to the myth of Persephone. We had that there. Um, so that, that chapter in Hades, where they go to the land of the dead, is chock full of illusions, but there's all kinds of other illusions woven in here. Anytime you have a reference to a king or a location, um, there's there's plenty of references to Minos and Crete, especially when Odysseus uh, comes back to Ithaca and pretends to be from that location. And so um, there's connections there. But anytime you have a reference to something that was earlier and that the Greek audience would have known, um, it's an illusion. And hopefully you've gotten to the point where you can just sort of see them and pull them out and think about them and understand what's going on. Um, let's see. Rhetorical question when a character or narrator asks a question that either has no answer or has an implied answer. Uh, the suitors do this a lot. Um, they ask derogatory questions with implied answers. Uh, so does the maid. You know, are you crazy? The, the evil one. Um, <laughs> 
can't remember her name off the top of my head either. Uh, but you get you get all kinds of, of rhetorical questions in there. Tone is the emotional quality of a piece of writing. It expresses the speaker's attitude toward the subject. Different characters have different tones towards the subjects they're talking about. Uh, I don't think I ask any questions about tone on this assessment, um, but the tone of heroic epics is generally what we call a high heroic tone. Um, poetic justice, that's one we definitely want to look at. Uh, it's when a character gets what he or she deserves, good or bad. So it's kind of like another word for karma, but just like hyperbole is another word for exaggeration. And when you're writing academically, you want to use hyperbole. Same thing, poetic justice, karma. When you're writing academically, use poetic justice. Uh, we like it when characters get what they deserve. And obviously Homer did too, because Almost everybody who does something wrong in his story gets punished for it, thereby, you know, reinforcing the theme of respect for the gods and respect for society and the ways of society. The suitors, look what happens to all of them. The Cyclops, when he disrespects Zeus, look what happens to him. Odysseus, when he's arrogant, look what happens to him. Uh, you could just go through and look down the whole list and see how it all, you know perpetuates the ideals of Greek society by giving people what the Greeks believed they would deserve. Um, there's no question about onomatopoeia on there, but it's when a word is defined by the sound they make. And there's plenty of onomatopoeias in, in the Odyssey. Whenever you've got an action story and things are happening, you have clashes and bangs and booms and things like that. Um, the story is not a fable. A fable is a story involving talking animals with a clear moral lesson. There was a famous Greek that told fables. His name was Aesop, and he told all kinds of fables, but we're not dealing with that here. Um, allegory is when a story has two or more levels of meaning, a surface level and a symbolic level. We dealt with that with Animal Farm. Um, there are, I think, some allegorical implications in the Odyssey. You could take particular scenes and say, that in this scene, Odysseus represents this, and um, his adversary represents this, and we're trying to teach a lesson, like the Lotus Eaters, okay? That would be a scene that you could look at, and you could say, hey, this might be an allegory. Maybe the, the Lotus represents drug addiction, or alcohol addiction, or whatever, and how people um, choose it ahead of their families when they have a choice to either help their family or abuse whatever their addiction is they choose their addiction and so you could look at that that episode and say hey it's an allegory and these represent these and those represent those and you know whatever uh there's probably more episodes in the odyssey that you can look at that way if you wanted to uh comic relief is a funny moment in a tragic or dramatic work to release tension I'm sure there are these funny moments. I think for the most part, he uses irony to bring them about. And that's, um, we're, we're going to get to that next. Uh, so there's three types of irony. We did some classwork on it. I want to make sure that you, you understand those. Uh, first, we have the situational irony when actions taken by a person or character have the opposite of the intended result. We looked primarily at the suitors with this kind of a, an irony. Um, for example, uh, it is ironic that Antinous wanted to make himself seem like a bigger guy by calling Odysseus names and throwing um, a stool at him. But what ended up happening is he made himself look small and particularly weak and worthless in that scene. So it actually had the opposite of the intended effect. And that would be an example of situational irony. Um, you know, Odysseus telling the Cyclops his name he wanted to become more famous and increase his reputation, um, but what ends up happening is he ends up not being able to get home for an extra seven years, and, you know, like, all of this hardship comes to him, so he thought he was going to make his life better by telling the Cyclops his name, but he actually made his life worse. So, like, you can go through and you can identify all of the various moments of situational irony. There's a ton of them, uh, but you should be able to identify at least one. Uh, verbal irony is when a person or character's words have an intended meaning that's the opposite of their literal meaning. So, for example, when Antinous calls Odysseus a rat and says that beggars like him are eating up all the food in the establishment, it's incredibly verbal ironic, verbally ironic because a rat is sort of the opposite of a king. Like, what's the highest thing you can be a king? What's the lowest thing you can be a rat? And the truth is the opposite of what he's saying. Uh, but also, it's Odysseus's house, so he's not really a beggar. The only beggars there are the suitors themselves. And so 
he says these things and he means them literally, but we as readers are able to take them ironically because we know the truth. Uh, and so that would be an example of verbal irony when a character says something and the words are literally the opposite. Um, another example, well, we'll just, we'll just keep, I, I guess, yeah, sure. Uh, when Odysseus tells the Cyclops that his name is nobody. Uh, <laughs> You know, there's there's verbal irony there as well. We know that he's not nobody. Uh, in fact, he's the opposite. He's the, the central character of the story itself. Uh, that would be an example of verbal irony. Dramatic irony is when the reader of a book or the viewer of a play um, knows something that characters don't know. And so, obviously, this is entirely full of dramatic irony, especially when Odysseus disguises himself as a beggar and goes to his own house. We all know who he is, but lots of the other characters do not know. And, you know, you get a lot of, of these scenes or moments where <laughs> it's sort of amusing because we know things that the other characters don't know. Um, we also know things that Odysseus doesn't know based on what the muses tell us at the beginning of the story, too. So uh, we get we get some information that other characters don't know. Um, and it may even be the protagonist. Uh, okay, uh, we've got some epic and Greek terms, but I'm going to stop and upload this video, and then I'll record another one to do those, because uh, I feel like we're going to need a break here for a second.